since my son loves soccer, I did my best to wear the Mexico colors, you know, green and white, almost white. So <laughs> the only shopping I did was to buy a jersey. <laughs> so um, I love stories. Okay, so I'm going to share some stories with you. And whatever I have to say, I'm going to say through the stories. So the first story is about a couple who move into a new neighborhood. And they look out the window. And every day, the neighbor is drying dirty clothes. So the wife looks at the husband and says, what's the point? You know, every day she's putting dirty clothes. Husband says, I have no idea. So one day she wakes up and the clothes are clean. And she says, what happened today? The clothes are clean. The husband says, I woke up today and washed our windows. <laughs> you know, most of the time when we look at the world, we say, what's wrong with it? Because we are looking with it from our point of view. So today, the, one of the biggest things that's happening around us is that we are moving from a very, very industrial economy to a very creative economy. You know, whether it is Donald Trump coming or Airbnb becoming big or whether it is Uber or there are so many things that are coming at us that we say, I never expected this. I never knew this would happen. So let's think a little bit about what does it take to prepare us for this new world order, for this creative economy? What is the winning formula? So I'll talk about it in the context of a win. So the win, the W, the first one stands for, is my favorite thing, is that, you know, the workplace has been something that's very industrial. You know, eight to five you work, six to ten you're home, and no emotions at work, shareholder value, very, very analytical, you can't talk about anything, and then you go home and then you have all the fun. That's how the world was. But that's no longer true. Our work and our home are mixing in bigger ways than ever before. So what that means, what the W stands for is women. We need a lot more women in the workforce. You know, today there are about 49.6% women in the world, but if you look at the workforce, only about 50% are women compared to 77% are the men. So the women have to work, be in the workforce a lot more. Now let's stop for a second and say we keep, we have all these statistics, you know, Fortune 500 companies, CEOs, blah, blah, there aren't enough women. Uh, for a minute, if you think about it and say, why are they not there? A, maybe because there is a glass ceiling, there's all the other things, but maybe they're smarter and they're saying, who wants this bullshit life, you know? All day long, you slog it out. You have no time to spend with your family. You have no time to have any balance. You have all the money in the world and ulcers in your stomach. You die young, you know, with heart attacks. Who wants this lifestyle? Maybe they're much smarter. And they're saying, you know, I'm going to have a little balanced life. But having said that, we need the brain power of the women to be in the workplace. So A, the workplace has to change in a huge way, whether it is every company does a deal with the childcare so that there's a childcare facility right outside the company, there is nursing home facilities, there's elder care, there's a whole bunch of things that are integrated into the system. So the women come in a big way. So I'll tell you another story of why women are good. So this is a story of a woman who is um, married to a miser. You know, and her friends say, why don't you leave him? She says, no, I can't leave him. And of course, he's dying. They say, at least let him be dead. You'll make, get all the money. So the day before he dies, I mean, or whatever, few days before he dies, he tells her, I want you to promise me that you will burn all the money with me when I die. And the wife says, okay. Now her friends are really upset. They're like, are you really mad? You know, you're asking, you said yes. She said, yeah, you know. He said it, I will say yes. Let him be a happy man when he goes. So the husband dies, the cremation is over, they all come home. And they say, so did you do it? She said, yeah, I did it. She says, but I didn't carry, see you carrying bags and bags of cash. She says, because I wrote a check for the entire amount he owns and put it in the funeral pyre. <laughs> so she did what everybody else wanted, also got what she wanted. That's why we need women around a lot. The second one of the win is, and, uh, and we need to make our workplaces 
comfortable for them because they're not going to change. Okay? The second thing in I is interdisciplinary approach. There are two things for I for me. One is interdisciplinary approach. The second one is internal. And what I mean by that is that some of the greatest ideas may come from something that has nothing to do with what you're doing. We are all so specialized, we are so busy. Where do we have the time to learn about anything other than what we are doing? That's why you need gatherings like this. You need to learn about everything from medicine to art to architecture to philosophy to why is penguin a dinosaur to all kinds of things, you know? Because you never know what might spark an idea. So this interdisciplinary is important. The second thing internal, what I mean is that we need to find out what is in our culture that makes us and keep it. Don't just ape somebody. Be what you are, be the fashion. You know, I mean, I, my friend uh, gave me a charm with Frida Kahlo, my favorite woman, cool woman. And look at her. I went yesterday to her home. I was looking at all the clothing and all that stuff. So fiercely Mexican and so amazingly global. We need to do more of that. Be fiercely local and proudly global instead of just making everything homogenous. The last thing, N, is about nothing like me. We need to be friends with people who are nothing like us. You know, this whole Donald Trump election was a wake-up call for me. I have over some 3,500 people on my Facebook wall. Not a single one of them supported him. What does that say? That I have a very skewed group of friends. I don't have a worldview. I have no idea what happens in the minds of the people. So we need to be friends with people who are nothing like us, who come from different cultures, different backgrounds, different professions, people who are blue collar, white collar, wealthy, not wealthy. You know, talk to the household help to see what's going on. Talk to the cab driver, talk to people to find out what's going on. So we need to have, be surrounded people who are nothing like us. So the winning formula is we need more women, we need to be more interdisciplinary, we need to be more proud of who we are, and we need to be surrounded people who are nothing like us. Now, what does all this mean? You know, does this, all these talks, all this stuff we do, result in any action, or is it just we come here, feel good, and go home? There's only one step that is between an idea and reality that is the action of the listener. So when someone says something and you listen, and if you act on it, that's how things happen. And I'll give you a few examples. We had a woman called Sunita Krishnan who runs a home for um, women she rescues out of prostitution. And nobody wants her living in their neighborhood because nobody wants ex-prostitutes in their neighborhood. This is in India. So she gave a very powerful talk, and people were moved, they were crying, and very easily they could have gone home, and then life happens. What we did was, we asked people, who wants to act on this? Because she can't have a permanent home. So people put their hands up, we followed up with them, we collected the money. 18 months from the time she stood on the stage, she has a 10-acre campus outside Hyderabad where all the women live together. They have a crash. They can leave the women, children there, go to work. We connected them to high-tech companies, so they're being trained to be professional. That's the power of the audience. That's the power of the action. I'll give you a second example. There's a gentleman called Arunachalam, and he is a seventh grade failed, and he created the lowest cost sanitary napkin. He's one of the most hilarious talks about, you know, imagine a man in a village trying to create a sanitary napkin. So nobody, he couldn't ask women to try, so he wore a sanitary napkin, put like a bladder with uh, blood in it, kept pumping it to test his sanitary napkins. And, you know, when he, when he gave his talk, nobody knew about him. Within a few weeks, he had millions of hits. So on my way over here, I'm sitting in the Lufthansa lounge, and here, New York Times, of course, on one side is something I don't want to read. On the other side is a full article about Arunachalam on the front page of New York Times. 
So he's become a global icon. And there are many companies that have started now to do low-cost sanitary napkins. Now, we took this gentleman to a college like this. There were about 1,000 people, not this many people. So Arunachalam spoke, and people were inspired. So there were two kids sitting in the audience who were very inspired to become entrepreneurs. So what they did is they went out. They just said, we don't know what we want to do. We'll just keep doing a bunch of products. So this is a product that they have created. The name of the company is Inkinite. And so these are like blank pages with plastic, and they have a special pen. You write with the pen, and you erase it, and they can re reuse the same notebook over and over again. So remember in childhood, we used to have slate and how we used to erase and write it again? They're doing that with the book. So with the same book, you can use it for months on end. You can take your notes, and they are coming up with the technology so that you can just put your phone on it, not even take a picture. It'll grab all the images and turn them into text, so it'll be stored for you. So the reason I'm saying all these things is that the talks that are given here, the stories that are told, the things that are happening around you to people, if you choose to act on it, there could be amazing change out there in the world. So the one thing I want you all to do is act on something that has nothing to do with what you're doing and make a difference to the person. The question I ask myself is that did that person's life change? because they met me, even if they know it or not. That's what makes me excited every day. So the last thing I want to say is that I'm really excited to be working at the intersection of companies, communities, and culture. Because, again, when I was working at Intel, when I was doing a bunch of things, people would say, Lakshmi, don't go around hugging people, and I would cry in meetings, and you know, it's sort of like, don't be such a girl, don't be so emotional, be stoic, and all that stuff. And guess what? A man who wrote about emotional intelligence won the Nobel Prize. So ultimately, 20 years later, I have been proven right that it is OK to be emotional. And it is, the companies are looking to see how can we bring innovation into our companies? How can we deal with all these young people? So the thing that's most needed is that the community work and the cultural icons, they all have to come together. If you think of the greatest people alive in this world, what they contributed was amazing buildings and cultural, her cultural heritage, supporting the poet, supporting the artist, it is the duty of the corporation, which are the largest economies today, to take care of everything, not just as a CSR, but as a way of being. And this is the global renaissance. We are on the brink of a global renaissance. The fact that 5,000 people are here listening to something that has no business value to you is amazing. Because you never know. The business value will come unexpected, and you'll be prepared. And that's what's great about it. So I want to end by another story, by saying that this is a story of a wise man who's passing through a village. And he sees a snake. And nobody is outside, because everybody's afraid of the snake. So the wise man talks to the snake and said, don't do this. You know, let the villagers come out and play. So a year later, he's passing by. Everybody's out playing, and the snake is, you know, like whittled down, sitting somewhere, and he says, what happened to you? He says, you asked me not to bite anybody. Nobody's afraid of me anymore. So they abuse me. I get no food. Nobody's afraid of me anymore. So the person says, I asked you not to bite them, but I didn't ask you not to hiss. So we all need to know when to fight and hiss, when to stoop to conquer, and when to support somebody else, and when to take the stage. That's when amazing things are going to happen in the world. You know, the tragedy in the world does not happen because of the tyranny of the terrible people. It happens because of the in indifference of the intelligentsia. So all of us, if we can listen to ideas and do something about it, we will have a global renaissance, and that's our dream. Thank you. That's it.